I want to talk to you about creativity and your, your new book about creativity. Because right. one of the things about it is that the cryptic crossword gives you an aha moment, which is yes. very pleasurable. Very. And, um, yes. So, you, so your book came out, what, about four months ago, was it? Something uh, like yeah, that? That, that's right. And yes. uh, it has only been mentioned once in the British press, which uh, does remind you that if you want to get any mentions in the British press, don't criticise them. You know, I got uh, a, yes. a favorable review in the Financial Times. And otherwise, there's been sort of radio silence or newspaper silence. But it's been very well received by writers. I was working at the moment on a film script, and the writer, one of the young writers, there's four of us, said to me yesterday, he said, This has been an strange experience for me because. We've been sitting here having fun, telling each other jokes, going off into irrelevant areas. And he said, we've done more in two weeks than I managed to uh, accomplish in six months because everyone's right. playful and we're getting good ideas. And he said, I'm so used to sitting in front of a typewriter, grinding it out with furrowed brow, <laughs> but to suddenly yeah. discover this other way of working. Um, it's been an absolute revelation to him. And I always start out by sort of talking about Robert Edison, you know, about how he used to uh, sit in a comfortable armchair with a handful of ball bearings. Have you heard that? Uh, I didn't know that, no. He, used to, he yeah, thought I, he got know. a great idea somewhere between, you know, a wakefulness and sleepfulness. And so he used to sit in a comfortable chair with a handful of ball bearings and a metal plate. So when he actually goes yeah. off, the noise of the bell bearings dropping onto the plate would wake him up and he'd pick them up again and continue. But he felt that it was in that dreamy state that he got his best ideas. And it's so contrary to all. I mean, in education, your whole education, did anyone ever tell you about how to be more creative? <laughs> certainly not. And they certainly didn't encourage me to take more sleep. But, I, I, but there is a very robust literature on sleep helping with creativity. Um, and it's about stilling that uh, anxious little voice that's going, come on, get on with it, produce. And you'll never produce anything like that. I suppose that's what you mean by being playful, is that you let all yeah, that go. That's right. Uh, what I've realised over the years... Um, I came across, when I realized, when I came across, when I came across um, McKinnon's research on the, the architects, when he compared the creative ones with the non-creative ones and found there were only two distinctions. One was that the creative ones could play and the other one was that the creative uh, ones took longer to make up their minds, which are both yeah. not um, <laughs> big fans of the left hemisphere. <laughs> no, that's and true. I mean, when I, when I when I got fascinated by that, I found a book called Homo Ludens indeed. by somebody called Heisinga. How do you say his name? That's it. That's the man. Yep. And he said that yep. play has to be separate from everyday life. And yeah. I spent a lot of time thinking about that, and I thought that's because children are completely playful and they've lost it by the time of 16, and they can be playful because they haven't had it educated out of themselves. And also, more important, they don't have responsibilities. That's because a very important got, point, isn't you know, it? Yes. If you've got to pick one kid up at four o'clock and someone else has got to make some of the kids breakfast, uh, dinner, uh, you've got those on your mind. And kids don't have those. Somebody's minding the shop. And I think the most right. important thing is to say to yourself, I'm not minding the shop for the next hour and a quarter. And push those thoughts away. And then you can relax because, as you say, you're not um, being constantly made anxious. And anxiety, any kind of pressure stops us mm. from being creative, and including time pressure. Well, yes, and, and you say somewhere that the greatest enemy of creativity is interruption, I think, interruption. which, I mean, it, in the present uh, cultural climate is something that most people live with all the time. All the time with these bloody phones. 
You yes, know, I went back to someone in Dubai a few weeks ago and he made me laugh out loud because he said he loves to be quiet and doesn't want to be interrupted. And his daughter pushes the door open and says, Dad, I'm not interrupting you. <laughs> <laughs> she says, no, I'm not. I'm not. I just want to know. You know, they don't get what an interruption is. And I've, no, I've, no, I was talking to Judd Apatow recently, and we both quoted different research, but somebody said that if you are interrupted in your plan of thought, let's say you take a phone call, it costs you 12 minutes after the phone call before you can get back where you were I before. I think it, at least that, yeah. At least Judd Apatow said it was 20 minutes. Yeah, so yeah. none of these things are taught us at school. None of this stuff about the downside. There are plenty of upsides of the left hemisphere, but there's no talk about the downsides of the left hemisphere, which is why I regard your book as the most interesting book I've ever read in my entire fucking life. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's very nice of you to say so. Um, but I think uh, one argument that has been commonly made is that our educational system is all about what I would call driving the, the priorities of the left hemisphere and it, it encourages um, convergent thinking so you've got a task you focus on it and you do step after step and then you arrive at the conclusion whereas what we know is very important for creativity is divergent thinking which will only happen when you stop you take the sort of pressure lid off and allow things to sort of expand a little bit yes that's right and and there's all when you the moment that you get into a relaxed and spontaneous uh, framework um, um of a set mindset and then uh, at that at that moment a humor comes into it there's oh, always yeah. a humorous atmosphere you know but I have a little story which I think shows how it gets educated out of us because there was a guy from Hallmark's Cards who used to go into school to talk about creativity and he said if he had a class of six-year-olds he'd say who's creative. All the hands went up. Ten-year-olds about half the hands went up. They said by the time he got to 16 you said who's creative. People sort of looked around the room to see who this weirdo was. Uh, and, yeah. and and I was thinking, why does it, because you, you're not sort of told don't be creative. And then I remembered I had to write an essay when I was 15 or 16 about time. And I thought yeah. this is not easy. Yeah. So I wrote the whole essay about the fact that I hadn't had time to write the essay, giving all the excuses why I hadn't got actually around to it. And, you know, most people would nod and smile when I told them that story, but not my English teacher, because he said to me, John, this isn't a proper essay. And that sort of sums up how we get rid of kids. You know, we don't, we're not nasty to them. We just say, no, no, this isn't it. This is not what we're after. Well, yes. I mean, what would you say to something like this? I, I, I used to write poetry. Um, and I haven't for probably about 30 years. And I'd like, and there's a bit in me that says, I'd like to, I'd like to write poetry again, but I, I haven't the slightest clue how to, how to start that happening. Occasionally phrases come into my mind. Have you any advice for me? Yes, just sit there. <laughs> <laughs> just sit there and see what happens and don't try to control it. In poetry in particular, because you know a huge amount of it, you were taught, uh, you were a professor or, or whatever, you were at all souls for the very smartest people and you taught English. And it's an extraordinary thought that you decided it didn't work because you shouldn't try to explain a poem, you should experience it. Am I right? Yes, more, more or less, yes, yes, that's right. I mean, not that um there isn't something you can do but that most of the things that we do think of doing are destructive instead of as it were clearing away all the things that might get yeah. between us and the work of art which is a perfectly legitimate task we put ourselves in front of the work of art how clever i am i have this idea actually yeah. what he's saying is this uh, yeah. you know, <laughs> uh, and, <laughs> Uh, and this is quite 
quite the wrong direction, you know. I yeah. anyway, you know, I, I just felt that the, the the drive in academe was towards being abstract, um, being explicit, and uh, being disembodied, you know, and and and, and non implicit. And and works of art are embodied, and they're, they're like people, you know, they're like. We experience them and they have an individuality like a person. That's not what you find in academia when you look at a work of literature. Well, when I look at, uh, at, at critics in general, uh, I always get the impression that they somehow feel that they're superior. Oh, yeah. To the people whose work they're criticizing, which is, of course, insanity. But that is the left hemisphere exerting its power. It has to be in charge, doesn't it? And that's why you get that. I read a book recently by Terry Eagleton on humor, and it just consisted of a series of quotes from other philosophers and critics. There were very few quotes in there from funny people. It's as though the people who actually make other people laugh were, were not relevant to this topic. And... Oh. Uh, yeah, it was just, it always struck me. And one of the great things about getting your book is what, reading your book was to realize why it is that critics have this all, this sort of vague feeling of superiority over the people whose work they're criticizing. You know, as though they're, it hasn't, hasn't happened until they pass their opinion on it. <laughs> Absolutely. And you put your finger on something that troubled me very greatly was that, you know, instead of, you know, acknowledging that something very special has happened here that is not due to you, but somebody else, and try to contact that, we were yeah. cleverly sitting there having our own ideas about it. Yeah. Um, in fact, I think that education nowadays has become very much like that, that instead of opening ourselves up to possible other ways of thinking, other ways of experiencing the world, that people yeah. in the past had knowledge of and yeah. weren't so stupid. But we come along and, uh, superior to them. Oh, they didn't know about this. And look how they said this kind of thing and how terrible. Instead of thinking, well, gosh, maybe I don't know everything. But uh -huh. you're right. At that time when I was doing Lit Crit, I didn't know anything about the hemispheres. But later, I discovered that one of the things about the left hemisphere is that it literally does have a high opinion of itself. It takes that <laughs> superior. <laughs> <laughs> it takes that superiority. Oh, that's I know it all, you know. It's the um, nail on the head. It has a high opinion of itself. And when you read critics sometimes, you realize they do have a very high opinion of themselves. But I think the, the, <clears throat> this idea was seeded in my mind when I was at Cambridge the first time and I would talk to friends usually about movies and, and somebody would say, oh, I really like that movie. And someone else said, oh, you liked it, did you? <laughs> and they were, they were immediately, they hadn't liked it, but that made them superior to the person who had. And you could fall into that. Well, yes, I, when I say I like it, it I mean, I thought there were very good things in it, you know. And, and you suddenly realize that it's all about fucking ego, that, that uh, English criticism or the theatrical film critics, they couldn't make a movie, and that doesn't bother them at all. The fact that they couldn't do it doesn't bother them. Uh, it's all a question of, of, you know, sort of creating the impression that really somehow they're superior to all the people who can actually do it. You remember what Oscar Wilde said about the critics being like eunuchs? They watch yeah. it every evening, but they can't do it themselves. You know, that's it's just perfect. <laughs> Absolutely true. And, and the other thing is that that goes in that is, is and, and it came across in your little thing about, you know, oh, you liked it, did you? Is that you mustn't at any cost appear naive. You mustn't at <laughs> any cost, you must be defended against all possible attacks. Whereas in experiencing people, experiencing life, in experiencing art, you need a certain vulnerability. You need to make yeah. a bit of a fool of yourself if you're going to allow, or at least you, you, at least you must yeah. open yourself to the possibility that you will make a fool of yourself. And Wittgenstein actually said, you know, yeah. for heaven's sake, don't try not to be a fool, you know, be a fool. <laughs> <laughs> 